Good morning, Grace Church. How are you doing today? Awesome. We're glad you're here. This is an exciting day, right? It's amazing. And if you're online with us, we are so delighted that you're with us online. And our pr- prayer and hope is that you'll just engage with us and, and, uh, and you'll open your Bible with us and, and just follow along. So here we go. We're going to finish our last of our Colossians series. I'm disappointed that I, this is the last day. It's been a great series for me personally. And uh, we're going to move on to some new things. Uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Psalms for a short time. So today we're going to kind of finish it up. So uh, let's just jump right into it. Let me pray. And, uh, and then we're just going to jump right into it. I think it's going to be really solid stuff for you to take home today. Father, thank you for just the opportunity we have now to lean into you and to, Lord, to listen to your word, God. I pray that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but that we would be doers of it. God, give us the unction from the Holy Spirit to apply the word of God in our lives in such a way that makes a difference for us and the people around us. Thank you, Lord, for Paul's writings of this amazing sacred book, and may they resonate in our heart today in Jesus' holy and powerful and awesome name I pray. Amen. So if you brought your Bible or your phone or your iPad or whatever you have, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 4 today. And uh, specifically what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to look at three ways that Paul says that we can express ourselves in devotion to Christ. So anybody want to express their devotion to Christ? Amen? Is that something you want? So I think you should pay attention to this because I think Paul has some amazing things to say. And I'm just going to be right up front with you. Some things that I'm going to say today, I'm trying to work out in my own life. I'm trying to figure out how they work in my own life. And so uh, I just want you to struggle with me along the way. So Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 says, Devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about His mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not, who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right response for everyone. So as we look at this particular section of Scripture, we look at three things. I'm going to look at three quick things uh, about how to express your devotion to Jesus. And the first one that we're going to talk about is the concept of prayer. And prayer is something that I do. I do it on a regular basis, but I have to say it's not my strong suit. I have to tell you, if you were to ask me, I pray every day, but if you were to ask me how good are you at it, I would say, I'm okay. I'm not very good. I'm still learning how to pray effectively and righteously before God. And, uh, and uh, anybody else like that here today that, you know, you know you should pray. You do pray, but sometimes you wonder if you're really doing it the right way. Is that, does that resonate with anybody? So we're going to talk about that up close and personal a little bit. And... Um, I just want you to know, let me just start out right out of the chute by saying prayer is hard. It is a very difficult thing. Imagine this, that God somehow limits himself. This is, this is weird. God somehow limits himself to our prayer. That he somehow, somehow in a mysterious way, we're going to look at that word in just a minute. Somehow in a mysterious way, God has incorporated your asking with his delivering. I don't know why. But that's how it seems to unfold inside of the Bible. And, and I'm experiencing that in my own life, and I hope you do too. But uh, I, I'm going to tell you right up front, for me, prayer is a hard thing to understand and to practice. When I was a kid, uh, of course, now keep in mind, I was not a believer. You know, I didn't come to Christ until I was you know, an adult. When I was a kid, I used to pray every night. I believed in God, but I just didn't know Jesus. I used to pray every night that God would uh, give me a bicycle. That he would somehow give me a bicycle. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. And finally, I realized that God doesn't work that way. Have you ever discovered that too? That God doesn't work that way. So I stole one and asked him to forgive me. Because that's how God, that's how I knew how God works. No, I didn't really steal one, okay? I did not steal a bike. I'm just telling you, prayer has been a difficult thing for me to learn. What is the balance along the way? So let's go back and let's look at these verses up close and personal, if you, if you don't mind. Verse 2 says, 
devote yourself to prayer. That's a strong word. So we devote ourselves to a lot of different things. But what Paul says is that we're to devote ourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. There's that word again. We're going to see that often in the book of Colossians. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about. Now, I'm going to watch, I want you to watch this next phrase. His mysterious plan concerning Christ. So let's talk about prayer as it relates to this mysterious plan concerning Christ. Notice that Paul calls the life that a believer is called to a mysterious plan. Do you get that? It's a mystery. You and I are living out every day the grace of God, which is a mystery to the ages before us. It's a mystery. So here's the first thing I want you to know. Life, now get this, you might want to write this down. Life is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be lived. Do you get that? Life is not a problem to be solved. It is a mystery to be lived. I'm called by God into His mysterious plan. And every day I live out that mystery. And, and God has in, introduced a concept of prayer. So when you think about prayer, think about it in this way. That's how I should approach prayer. Prayer is about claiming the promises of God in the midst of this mystery. I'm, it's, it's about claiming the promises of God in the midst of this mystery. C.S. Lewis Great man of faith, great old dead guy. And this is what he says. He's talking with a pastor, a friend of his, regarding his wife's illness. His wife died of cancer. And uh, he was struggling a bit with why God would allow this to happen. And uh, he was talking to this pastor about prayer. And this is what C.S. Lewis says about prayer. He says, I pray because I cannot help myself. I'm drawn to it. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It does not change God. It changes me. That's the nature of prayer. Prayer isn't necessarily, sometimes what God does is does some miraculous things and you ask and He delivers and that's all good, that's great. I say amen and praise Jesus every time that happens. But oftentimes what God is doing in prayer is changing my perspective, changing my response changing my hope, changing my sense of faith. That's what God is doing in me. So having said that, knowing that we're supposed to devote ourselves to prayer, I think there are four dimensions to this prayer life that God has called us to. I don't know, like I said, I don't know a lot about prayer, but these four things I do know and I'm certain about. So let me tell you t today what I'm certain about. First of all, the first dimension that I think is here that I think you and I need to be certain about is the idea that I need to have consistency in my prayer life. And that's where most of us fall down, right? You know, we get all hot and bothered and think, I got to pray. And, you know, we charge hell with a squirt gun. And, you know, we're praying and praying and praying and praying. And then we fall off the wagon and realize we haven't prayed for a week. Anybody here <laughs> like that? Come on now. That's how kind of it works in our lives. So there needs to be, I need, what I need to learn to do is develop a consistency in prayer. After all, it says in our text, devote yourself, devote yourself to prayer. So as a young believer, I was taught this concept, and I want to share it with you today. I was taught when life gets hard, when you get down, when life gets you down, you should push. Now keep that word in mind, you should push. When you're having trouble on your job, things are not working out well, you should push. When bills are high and monies are low, push. When people aren't responding in ways that you would hope you would want them to respond, push. When people don't understand you, push. So what do I mean when I say push? Well, it's an acrostic, and this is what it literally means. Pray until something happens. P-U-S-H. Pray until something happens. I'm not necessarily saying that God's going to move a mountain. He could. He has a certain capability of doing that, right? Right? I'm not saying he won't. I'm just saying what God wants to do is he wants to teach you how to learn to persevere in the midst of difficulty in the concept of prayer without losing heart. And that requires amount of faith. So I recently heard a story about a five-year-old kid named Johnny, and he really wanted a baby brother. So he went to his dad, which is where every five-year-old goes, and says, listen, Dad, do you think that you could give us a baby brother. I, want, I really want a baby brother. 
So his wise dad said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to pray about it for two months. And I will, he gave a Pastor Dan phrase here, I will guarantee God will answer your prayer. So here's what dad knew. Dad knew that mom was already expecting and was due in two months. So, you know, wise thing, you know, okay, teaching his son how to have faith, how to pray. So Johnny starts his journey of prayer. And he does really good for one month. And then he just gets discouraged and he gives up and he stops praying. And, and then the next month happens. And dad takes him into the bedroom and opens, you know, the door. And there's twins there. There's two, not one, there's two. There's two boys. There are two boys. And God, you know, basically, you know, dad says to Johnny, man, aren't you glad you prayed? And look how God has blessed us. And, and uh, Johnny said, aren't you glad that I quit praying after one month? <laughs> That's the kind of faith that I want to have, don't you? I want to have Johnny's kind of faith that, that you know, that when I speak, heaven listens and and that's the kind of faith that I want. But more, most importantly, the kind of faith that I want to have is the kind of faith that prays when it's good or it's bad. When God answers or when He doesn't answer according to my expectations. That's the kind of prayer life that I want to have. Then there's a second dimension to this prayer life that I need to have. And this is I'm certain of. And the Bible tells me that I'm to be watchful in my prayer. Be watchful. So what does that mean? Well, the Scripture literally says to have an alert mind. So what does it mean to have an alert mind in prayer? Well, 1 Peter 4, 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. This means to be vigilant to notice the God-sized opportunities that happens as we walk through life. That you and I are to be watching for what God wants to do. I don't I don't ask God to join me in what I want to do. I want to ask God to join Him in what He wants to do. So when I'm watchful, what that means is, is that I'm looking for God-sized opportunities, those spaces where I can stand in the gap and ask for God to get involved. And, and it, when I'm looking for those, and God already wants to do that, it is a winning combination. And voila, we have answered prayer. I look for opportunities to step in the gap where others might see problems or pain or bad luck those who are watchful in prayer see a call to seek the Lord's favor looking for looking for that opportunity <clears throat> in the early days of Dallas Theological Seminary it was at a critical it was at a critical place and they needed $10,000 almost immediately if they, if they were going to keep their doors open and serve students and in those days, $10,000 was a lot of money. And they had a guest lecturer. His name was Harry Ironside, who was a famous old dead guy, really good theologian. And uh, he was lecturing that day at the school. And he gets up and he prays for the, for the student body and for the school. And he says, Lord, you own a cattle on a thousand hills. Please sell some cattle and help us meet this need. That was his simple prayer that he prayed that day. And shortly after that prayer, just a couple days later, a check came in the mail for $10,000 and uh, it had this note on it and it says, the man simply said, the man that was donating the money said, uh, simply, this is what happened, sold some cattle, here's the, here's the money. I mean, God does those kind of things when you're watchful. When you're watching in prayer, God is a very faithful God. Then there's a third dimension of prayer that I'm certain of that needs to be in my life and I am not great at this, I'm learning, and I hope you are learning too. And that is the idea that what God wants and requires of me in prayer is to always be thankful in advance. Not afterwards, in advance. A thankful heart. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done in advance. That's the implication. That I should be praying and I should have this thankful heart. I want you to notice... How often, as we've studied through the book of Colossians, this idea of being thankful comes up. It is a big deal to God. And it is a small deal in our life, but the idea of developing that, that discipline is huge. And then there's a fourth dimension 
that I believe it is absolutely essential if I'm going to learn how to pray effectively, and that is to learn how to be purpose-driven in my prayer. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3 says, this is Paul's prayer request, pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about His mysterious plan concerning Christ. Paul is saying, listen, let God open doors for me. Pray that God would open doors for me. That is, that's why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. So you see how purpose-driven this is? This is a purpose-driven prayer. This isn't about, oh God, I need a bicycle. Oh God, I need $10,000. This is about the kingdom. You want to start seeing God answer your prayer. Start being kingdom-minded in your prayer life. God, bring your kingdom. God, open doors. God, let me. How about this prayer? This is something that you should pray every day, that God will answer if you are, if you are open to his answer. God, would you please open a door for me so that I can clearly and effectively influence someone for Jesus today? That would be an amazing prayer-minded kingdom, purpose-driven prayer. And that's the kind of prayer that I believe that God delights in answering. It is so good. So the first expression of devotion is prayer. There's a second dimension of devotion, ex expression of devotion, and it's found in verse number five. How are we doing so far? We having fun yet? All right, good. I'm having fun. Verse five says, live wisely among those who are not believers. This is the next expression of devotion. So God calls me to live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. So here's the truth. Here's the truth that you need to know. Somebody is watching your faith. Somebody's watching your faith. Somebody's watching how you respond in your neighborhood, on your job, wherever you're at. Somebody is watching your faith. And here's the good news. I've got some great news for you. You don't have to be perfect for them to respond to your faith. What you have to be is sincere and genuine. If you've got sincerity in your life, they, they don't want to know. Do you? In fact, it's, it discourages people if they think somehow <clears throat> your life is perfect. That discourages people. You know why? Who could live that? Come on now. Who could live that? Who lives the perfect Christian life right now? I don't. I struggle. I'm broken. I fall. I fail. I mess up. What they're watching in my life is what I'm going to do with that failure. What I'm going to do with that sense of brokenness in my life. That's what they want to know. Is there a place? Is there hope for me? So how do we live wisely in this present age? We live sincerely. We live in the sense that God... God, people are watching my life and I want them to be able to see. I want them to see my struggles. I want, them to see, I want them to see who I really am. I don't want to pretend to be anything. I just want to be your follower and your son and your child. When people see that, then that's living, that's living wisely among people who don't believe. And it is so powerful and so good and so refreshing when Christians begin to live that way. And the worst way you can live is to project your standards on other people's lives. I mean, that just shoves people out the door before they even know Jesus. Let them see your sincerity, your genuine love, your genuine concern, your genuine sense of a willingness to be transparent when things aren't going well inside of your life. And I, I believe... That's what it means to live wisely among unbelievers. There's a third expression of devotion, and it is the idea of speaking with grace, to speak with grace. Verse 6, this is what it says, let your conversation, and we're going to, not just your conversation, but your conduct, be gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right to respond, the right response for everyone. So let your conversation be gracious. So I guess I want you to understand something. This is really important to me for you to understand. Is that do you understand how important your words are? What comes out of your mouth 
is crucially important, not only to God, but the people around you. Words can either give life or that they, they can bring death. Your word. Your words can either bring life or death. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions that I think are really important. And I'm going to start with this question. What is spewing out of your mouth? What is, what's coming out of your mouth? Now, I know that you and I live in a world that when things go bad, there's expression that is inappropriate. Things like bitterness. If bitterness is coming out of your mouth, if out of your lifestyle, there's something, there's a disconnect between you and what God is doing in your life. Bitterness can never, you can never have, listen to me carefully, you can never have bitterness and joy at the same time. You just can't. You cannot have bitterness and joy at the same time. So whatever it is that's spewing out of your mouth is telling. How about filthiness? You know, obviously in our culture, via media, whether it be social media or movies or whatever else there is, is that filthiness is a part of our culture. And we've kind of bathed ourselves in it and we accept it as a way of life. But listen to carefully. Paul doesn't see it that way. Neither does God see it that way. Filthiness can't be a part of the conversation that spews out of our mouth, nor contempt be. You can't, have, you can't have joy and contempt in your life. You can't be that person that's always shaking your fist in the air and expect God to really use your life in a very powerful way. So be very careful with the words that you use. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive Ephesians 5, 4 says, but, but now you must put them all away. I didn't say that. Paul did. Under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, gossip, all that can't be named among people who believe in Jesus. And yet, that's how we share prayer requests, right? Slander, gossip. Let me tell you about so-and-so. They're really struggling. Let me tell you about their deep struggle. Let me tell you what's really going on here. And Paul says, smile when I say this. Paul says, put it away from you. Paul says, among people who name Jesus, it shouldn't be a part of our lifestyle. So here's the deal. This is what I've learned. You cannot take words back. (laughs) How many wish you could? This morning, (laughs) wish that you could take words back that you spoke. You can't take them back. I'm either giving life, I'm either breathing life on you, or I'm not. I'm either breathing life or I am presenting death. So for the believer, my conversations matter to God. James says it this way. James says that the tongue is like the rudder of a ship. And it has the capacity to change this little thing, this little rudder has the capacity to direct the whole ship. Little small thing. So the tongue is a world of fire, James says. So I need to learn to let my conversations be seasoned with grace. So you guys have heard of a dude by the name of Will Smith, right? Actor. He's also a rap artist and uh, a couple years back, he posted something on his Instagram that I thought was fascinating, powerful, awesome, sauce stuff. So I, I want to show it to you. Watch this. This is my grandmother. Um, we called her Gigi. And she was that grandmother at the church. You know the one I'm talking about, like devout, devout, devout. Like she was Jesus's girl. And I remember when I was about 12 years old, I started rapping. And so I got one of them little black speckled composition books and I started writing all my rhymes. You know, I'm in Philly, young boys. I had all my curse words and all that. And she found my rap book. And she never said anything to me, but she wrote in the back of it, Dear Willard, truly intelligent people do not have to use words like this to express themselves. Please show the world that you're as smart as we think you are love Gigi. And that was probably the single most impactful event that shaped how I led and how I still lead my career. 
How powerful is that, right? So grandma's words changed his life. And here's a guy that I dare say has made millions by doing it the right way, by not using filthy language that comes out of your mouth. That is such an important thing for you and I to hear. And uh, I love what he calls his grandma. You know, he, he, you know he's, she's God's girl. And uh, what a compliment that is. I want to be God's boy, don't you? I want to be God's boy. I, in the end, that's what really matters. I, wanna, I don't care who makes fun of me. I don't care who ridicules me. I just want God to smile on my life. And I hope that's where you are too. And if I'm going to do that, I've got to devote myself to letting my mouth reflect who I am in my heart. And who I am in my heart is a redeemed child of God. A joint heir with Jesus. An ambassador for Christ. That's who I am. So I've got to let that come out of my mouth. And I've got to recognize that in all of my power that I have on the planet, I have the power to heal with my words. I have the power to lift up. I have the, cow- I have the power to encourage. I have the power in my, in my words to change lives by how I use them. And if I use them well, what happens is, is God creates space for me to be used by Him. That is such an amazing thing. That's all God expects us to do is create the space so that He can step into that space and really transform someone's life. And that's, I think when you, get, when you understand that, it takes the pressure off of you. You just say, I'm just creating space here for God to do an amazing work of God. You know, here's, the, here's what's interesting is, is that all the people that are going to be baptized here today, somebody, somebody made space for them in their life. That's why they're here. Somebody had influence. And now they're here expressing with their mouth, with their mouth, their faith in Jesus Christ. So, Father, give us that kind of faith. Give us that kind of clarity. Give us that kind of perseverance. Give us, Lord, what, you, what we need to live and breathe in your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.